You know, um, when I very first met my wife, Shamily, who some of you know, I became fascinated by her lips. <laughs> she has very expressive lips that really uh, show every variety of emotion. And so it was, it was kind of actually a little inappropriate because I, you know, we, we didn't know each other that well. And when she would talk to me, my, my gaze would involuntarily drift towards her lips. I'd have to keep remembering, you know, eye contact. You know? <laughs> and I, I was all the time undeliberately fantasizing in my mind what would be, it be like to kiss those lips. You know, oh, don't think that thought. Pay attention. You know? <laughs> and finally... I did kiss those lips, and it was amazing. It was like it made every other kiss seem like a dress rehearsal. And then we were separated after that because we lived in completely different continents, so I actually relived that kiss uh, for months afterwards. And uh, I find myself in almost exactly the same situation standing here with you, because uh, <laughs> this is it, baby. <laughs> this is the kiss, you know? <laughs> because, you know, everybody has their heroes and, and the people you look up to and your role models, and it's a pretty amazing feeling to actually talk to the people you most respect. So uh, I've been involuntarily preparing for this moment for, for weeks. I'm going to talk at TLC. And uh, I'm sure I'll remember it afterwards, but right now, this is it, baby. This is the kiss. <laughs> and you know, it's funny what Robbie said about... about where's, where is Robbie? Uh, I had to pee. What? Okay, well, it's funny what he said about, you know, seeing me, because last night I was sitting at dinner, and uh, he was talking to um, Lisa Gar. And I was just watching him, the way he was talking and how he was paying attention and just how amazing Robbie is. And I, and I was having this thought as I was watching, like, wow, I want to be like that one day. You know? And then he got this image. So it's like we're actually mirrors to each other. You know, we, we, uh, we become inspirations to each other. So this journey actually began with... Maybe it didn't. What's going on? It didn't move. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, yes. It, no, go back. There we are. It began with a car accident. Uh, two years ago, it was in May of 2016, I was involved in a really intense car accident. Like, I mean, full speed car accident. Uh, and it was, that is actually not a picture of the car I was driving, because after you've been in an accident like that, you don't think about taking selfies. You know, you're <laughs> too busy with bleeding. So, but it was a very intense accident. Um, I was actually driving in the middle lane, so there were cars on the left and the right. Uh, there was a collision. And the next thing I knew, I was in the middle divider between the, you know, I don't know how I got from there to there. I was unconscious, but I somehow... But what's even more strange is the car looked like that. I had no broken bones. Uh, so it felt actually like angels had just done something. Uh, and I had no broken bones, but I did for the first time find out subjectively about this thing people talk about. Um, what do they call it? Um, st Post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? So I went home, and I found I couldn't do anything for three months but stay basically in bed like, like this. I mean, my whole body was like this. Going in, driving anywhere was completely out of the question. As soon as I got behind a wheel, it became super traumatic. And so I spent three months basically looking at that. That's the, the view from our bedroom window. And I just stayed there and looked at those trees for three months. And you know what happens if you're kind of frozen in the bed? Uh, these, these kind of big life questions start to emerge on their own. You know, like, like, why are we here? And what am I doing with my life? And is it a smart thing to be doing with my life? 
And slowly, uh, I realized that I, I, I was running this coaching school that was very um, consuming, involved a lot of people. Um, but there was something uh, was not completely... Something was there that I would probably die one day and feel regret. And what actually what got, came clear to me a year later, I talked to Lynn Twist on, uh, on a Zoom call, and she said back to me a year later exactly what came clear laying on that bed. This, the video is a little jumpy because it was Zoom and the connection was not perfect, but this is what Lynn said a year later. People want to make a difference with their lives. That's number one. Mm. That's the most profound mm -hmm. way to live. Mm -hmm. That's actually what everybody longs for more than anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, food and shelter and all that stuff, it's, you don't have to have that first. Mm -hmm. Taking care of oneself in order to be of service makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. But taking care of oneself to take care of oneself mm -hmm. doesn't really give you satisfaction. People will give up anything to mm -hmm. make a difference with their life. Mm -hmm. Anything. If they, if they get a whiff of what it means to live a life that matters, mm -hmm. that is a contribution, mm -hmm. that is, it doesn't have to be self-sacrificing mm -hmm. where you give things up. No, it's so fulfilling. You mm -hmm. sacrifice nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you gain everything. Yeah. All right. So... It was that kind of flavor that really r revealed itself laying on the bed. And later, I asked a lot of people the same question, once this rearranged itself. And, and these were some of the answers that, that I got, was uh, having a sense of mission, being on fire, living with passion, knowing what I'm here to do and doing it every day, living authentically, Surrendering to something bigger than myself. Feeling taken over by a creative force which I can either resist and experience suffering or flow with. I'd be glad to share this with you. The whole, I'll send you the whole uh, presentation as a, as a, as a, as a movie. Uh, feeling so excited by what I have to offer that I stop thinking about myself at all. Feeling taken over by something greater than self-preoccupation. So that was really, that was the flavor that, that came to me, that actually, um, really the unnecessary element in my life that, was, that needed to disappear was me. So when there is a, a calling to be, a, when anyone has a calling to be of service in any way, whenever anyone feels a calling to make a difference, it has to begin with a thought, right? The, the first element, the first thing that happens is an event in consciousness. So let's take something that everybody can recognize that made a big contribution to everybody, like the Eiffel Tower, right? Everyone knows the Eiffel Tower. But before there was the Eiffel Tower, there had to be plans. It had to be drawn up. You had to, to, to draw it accurately before you could build it. And of course, before you could draw it, it had to be a thought in the mind of Gustav Eiffel, he, he, he had to have that as a flickering little impulse before it could become a reality. So we're all having thoughts all the time. According to the Laboratory for Neuroimaging at the University of Southern California, they figure that we have about 48 thoughts a minute. Of course, that's a pretty arbitrary figure. But if that's true, it means that you're having 2,000, almost 3,000 thoughts an hour. You're having 70,000 thoughts a day. 483 billion thoughts among all the people in the world, because there's 7 billion people in the world, and that means we're having a hundred and we collectively are having 176,000 trillion thoughts a year. That's a lot of thoughts. So the question comes, you know, obviously not all of those thoughts turn into the iPhone or... Uh, or um, curing a disease. Not, not all of those thoughts turn into chicken soup for the soul, you know, it's, uh, or uh, anything that any of us do. It's only a very, very few. How, what percentage of thoughts would you imagine actually bubble up and become life-changing for, for all of us? 
what would you guess? 1%? You know, that might be hopelessly optimistic. <laughs> might be one in a million or even, yeah. So, so I came to understand laying on that bed as I kind of, all I had to look at was my own thoughts. I came to understand there are actually, it seemed to me that there are actually two kinds of thought, right? So one kind of thought we could call horizontal. And that's a little bit like you're, you, you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and you, know, and you see like a, a little baby's hand holding an old, very old person's hand. You go, oh, share like heart, you know. <laughs> or, you, or, or you get, uh, you know, a sunset and, and somebody's kind of going like that with the sunset. Oh, share love heart, you know, <laughs> or, or something like that. And, and maybe then you come to a beautiful picture and it says, before you complain about anything in your life, be grateful. Okay? You go, oh, beautiful, share, love, likes. So you remember it. And then that evening, when your partner comes home, you say, how was your, how was your day? Oh, it was terrible. It was awful. I, I was stuck in traffic on the way to work. It was like an accident. I got like an hour late. I walked into the middle of the meeting. Everyone looked up like it was awful. You know, they asked me where was the report, and it was late. And then I had a stomachache at lunch, and then I had a headache all afternoon, and I had a flat tire on the way home. It was like the worst day ever. And you go, oh, you remember. You go, ah, well, before you complain about anything in your life, remember to be grateful. But it doesn't have the same effect that it did on you in the morning. You get slapped, you know, because it wasn't a fresh, original response to the moment. You know, it was a, it was a recycled thought. Right? It was a thought that you got from Facebook. Right? That had probably been recycled and shared a few times. And it was recycled, so when you deliver it, it doesn't have that same impact as when it was fresh. And I would suggest that most of the thoughts that pass through all of our minds are those kind of thoughts. Things that we've heard, things that we've been impressed by, inspired by, that get regurgitated and then recycled, and they're not actually a source of original brilliance. But then there is another kind of thought, which you could call a vertical thought. So instead of being like a bubble being promoted by other bubbles, it's a bubble that arises from a depth. It arises out of silence, and it slowly percolates its way up from that depth and becomes a thought that has never been thought before. It becomes, it turns into speech that has never been spoken before. It becomes action. It becomes something disruptive. I, and I just, these, these folks over here are just totally living what I'm talking about here. <laughs> like just, who says it has to be like that? It becomes disruptive. So as I was lying there in my post-traumatic stress state, what happened? Okay. Uh, it, it, I asked myself, what do we, how do we need to live? What do, what do we need in order to have more thoughts like that? Because, you know, m most of us, we agree, the world is not exactly the way we would vision it. It's like it, when we look at the world, if you look at the news, or something, you're going, like, oh, there, there's things that could definitely be working better. So what's the common denominator to all those things that don't work so well is people having original thoughts that disrupt the way we're used to doing things so we can do them in a new way. So what does it take? What is a human life like that is able to generate more of those thoughts? And what I understood was, you know, if you think about health, you know, what does it take to be healthy? It's not one thing, is it? If you want to be healthy, you need have good elimination every day. If you don't go to the bathroom for two or three days, you're going you're to feel very sick and toxic, right? But health is not only about the bathroom. That's, that would be reducing it. You also need to have good food. And those are opposites. You need to put good food in, get waste out, and then you have a chance to be healthy. In the same way, health is, you could say, well, you need to sleep. If you don't sleep for a few days, you're gonna, it's going to have a negative impact on your health. But good health is not only about sleeping. You also need to exercise and, and be energetic. So the combination of exercise and sleep, which are opposites, creates health, right? So in the same way, I came to, it sort of came to me, it revealed itself to me that the people I know who are the most brilliant people, which is actually you, and all and everyone we know, 
they display a mixture of qualities that actually display conflicting value sets, right? So it's like a paradoxical mixture of things that don't logically go together. And this became, once it, this revealed itself to me like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. You know, if you ever, when I get a jigsaw puzzle, I was trained by my father, who was very strict about jigsaw puzzles, that you don't look at the box. You know, you, you, you try to ignore the picture, you just spread all the pieces out. So as you put the jigsaw together, you slowly find out what it's a picture of. And that's what happened to me, is little, little fragments revealed themselves, but slowly, as those fragments came together, it became a cycle. So the cycle is something like a clock. Okay, you can say 12, 3, 6, and 9. And I want to first just, uh, although it's a continuous movement, I want to start just by isolating and describing four positions on the clock. So at the top, we could talk about awakening. What I mean by awakening is simply a moment where the usual boundaries of thought drop away and there is some kind of a recognition of consciousness without boundaries, space, silence, stillness. People often recognize that as your true nature, like who you really are when you're not caught in a movie. So the qualities of awakening would be no boundaries, infinite space, emptiness, no time, and no sense of me, because there's boundaryless, there's no sense of I, it's just space. Another station in this clock we could call creative flow, where things are flowing through you in an unstoppable way, like automatic writing. I remember when I visited Jack uh, a few years ago, I came to do a little interview with you at your house, and you showed me the room where you were writing, and you said sometimes you would start writing in the night, and then it would look up, it's dawn, and you were, when you were writing uh, success principles, and you were just writing all night. That's creative flow, or when you're musician jamming, and you just get into it, and it's just, you're being played more than playing. So this station, which is very different subjectively, but also involves very different brain activity, would be characterized by pleasurable, feels really good, a lot of energy, no effort, you feel invincible that you could do anything, and you feel very confident. A third station we could call achievement, getting things done making things happen in time. So this station is characterized by action, and it's the opposite of 12. 12, there was no boundaries. Now everything's about boundaries, right? It's about boundaries of time, boundaries of budget, boundaries of agreements, signing contracts, deadlines, and inevitably, some, eventually, some feeling of stress, like, oh, I've got to get this done. Right? The fourth station is really it's, it starts with feelings of, and we'll talk a little bit why later, but it starts with feelings of regret, shame, self-doubt, failure, inadequacy. Because when you get into this do, 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 do thing, that inevitably, sooner or later, you're going to mess up. Partly because you get faced with choices, like double-bind choices, where whichever choice you make, you're left with some feeling of regret. But this, if you can stay in this movement, it leads us to a place of self-forgiveness, forgiving other people, feeling relaxed, trust, innocent, and above all, it leads to a place of humility. I'm not, I'm not everything to everybody. I make mistakes. I learn from my mistakes, but I'm doing the best that I can. And essentially, I'm a good person. Now, actually, those are four stations, but what I, what I understood as I, in, as I was in this prolonged malaise, I understood that we don't really stay in one place. It's actually a continuous flowing movement. So we could now talk about four movements. The first, and it's interesting because the fullness of each movement is actually the soil in which the seed of the next movement begins. So the first movement starts in awakening, in, in moments of boundaryless consciousness. If we can hover there in awakening without holding on to it, I want to stay spacious, don't touch thought, don't touch thought, but also without over-encouraging it, like, yeah, we're going to you know, make, we've got to 
manifest. If you can just hang out there, you notice these little impulses are happening. In Kashmiri Shaivism, which is probably the, the best documentation of this phase, they talk about spanda. Spanda is just a natural shimmering that happens in consciousness that is not a doing, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a happening that we can either repress or allow to flourish. So the first movement is from these shimmering impulses to this full-on tsunami of flow. And the way that happens is through attention, through simply just paying attention, like, oh, look, it's, it's growing and growing. So that's the first movement. In that fullness, in that fullness of flow, one kind of flow, one kind of creative impulse, you could call intention. Intention is actually simply a kind of creative impulse, right? But it's a creative impulse now with the future attached to it. It's a, it's a, an, a creative act that now has a future state embedded in it. So this next movement is from intention to achievement. It's where you, it moves from seeing something as possible to achieving it. it. It actually moves through by taking action, but the action actually is, is a little different for men and women just because we're wired differently. So for a man, it's more fueled by testosterone, more fueled by pushing through boundaries to get to a goal. For women, it's more fueled by oxytocin and estrogen, which means it's more fueled by trust and collaboration, and we can do this together. We, I got your back, you got mine. But either way, it leads to achievement. Now, in achievement, whenever we get to a point of, I did it, I did it, one of the things that was necessary to get to a place of achievement is we were forced to make choices and to take responsibility for the choices. Unlike 12 o'clock, there is somebody here now, and that somebody signed a contract, and if you don't do what you said you'd do, you have to deal with the results. So this creates what Gregory Bateson, do you know Gregory Bateson? He was a great thinker in the 20th century. He describes this thing called double bind. And he says double bind is not just if you're unlucky, double bind is inevitable to a life of commitment. So if you, if you commit to making things happen, you're going to reach places where you have to make a decision, and either way, whichever way you decide, you're going to feel like you made a mistake to some degree because of the consequences of what you didn't decide. So the best example of this actually is my namesake, Arjuna, who you, who know, you know well. So in the Bhagavad Gita, he was, he was a Kshatriya warrior. He was on a team, and, uh, an army, and in the other team was his great uncle Bhima, who raised him from a child. So he's faced with this impossible choice. Do I go ahead and fight and risk killing what was basically like his father? Do I risk killing my, my spiritual father? Or do I not fight, which for a Kshatriya warrior is the greatest act of ignobility, the only thing you could really do is kill yourself then? So there was no way to make a decision that would not involve regret. That's a double bind. And if you actually, once you recognize the idea of double bind, and if you switch on any drama on the TV, you'll find any episode of any drama is actually presenting you with some kind of double bind. So you get like, oh, what are they going to do? That way, that way, either way, you can't win. Uh, it's really, it characterizes human life. And according to Bateson, it also characterizes evolution. So because of double bind, it means that really whenever we achieve anything, we experience some degree of regret. Some degree of, oh, yes, I did this, but... Maybe I burned myself out. Maybe I was a little abrupt with somebody. I, there's something was involved in that that I feel regret. And that is the next movement from regret to humility, regret to, to forgiving myself and realizing I did my best and I make mistakes, but I still show up again and do my best. So that is the, the, the next movement, and which is characterized by learning. And the last movement is from humility back to awakening. So when you're really hanging out, feeling 
yeah, I made a mistake. I'm not everything I could be. I'm just a little ant in the anthill, but I'm doing my best. Inevitably, sooner or later, you have some kind of an intuition, a whiff of something bigger than your own mind. If that intuition turns inward, it becomes awakening. It becomes like self-inquiry. Who is really here? It becomes a recognition of your true self. If that intuition is turned outwards to the beauty of the world, it becomes an intuition of God. But either way, it leads you to an intuition of something bigger than what I thought of as me. So that's the, the last movement, which brings us back into awakening again. So everything I've said to you so far is actually purely theoretical and actually somewhat useless, okay? <laughs> because, because nobody lives like that. Nobody actually lives perfectly through that cycle. What actually happens in reality is something that looks more like this. <laughs> because we are human, because we're, you know, hairless monkeys, we don't all... The... Well, with a little hair, okay, but we, we don't all the time show up as the perfect version of yourself. We get blocked. So actually, this map, so actually there was, yeah, there was, a, before we go on, this, Coop Blackson, my, one of the most brilliant people I know in this way, was kind enough to write the foreword to the book. And he said, the truth is, we are all born brilliant beings in touch with our essence and the stream of energy that flows through us. As children, we sing, we dance. The brilliance just moves through us, unimpeded, free-flowing, with no conditions placed on it. We're not worrying, oh no, I can't sing like Bruno Mars or Michael Jackson or Adele. Later, we start comparing ourselves to others. We get screwed up. We go into self-contraction. We become self-conscious. So in reality, what, what really characterizes our days is various forms of blockage. So, this map, which started out now as a, as a way to explain brilliance, can also be a way to explain why we're not brilliant, why we don't show up all the time as brilliant. It becomes quite a coherent map to explain absence of brilliance. So I've been working with uh, a small group of coaches, of the, the kind of the, the closest of the people I trained in previously, and we've been able to identify four kinds of blockage, four styles of blockage. The first is addiction. And the reason we get addicted is because all of those four points that we, that we looked at, none of them have a logical ending, right? So if you, for example, if you focus on awakening, I don't believe you can have the ultimately deep meditation, right? However much awakening you experience, there's no edge to infinity. You experience infinity, there's infinitely more infinity to experience. So consequently, actually, spirituality, strangely enough, can become an addiction. You could become addicted to wanting the ultimate awakening at the expense of the rest of the cycle. You can get addicted to creative flow, right? You, sometimes you meet somebody, oh, I'm working my novel. How long have you been working on it? Seven years. You know, it's, it's this thick, but you just can't quite bring it to a completion. Have you, you know, when you, when you have to actually finally send in the book to the publisher, honestly, do you have the feeling, it's done, it's perfect, I'm going to send it off? Or is it more like just your past deadline and you've got to send something in, right? Because it's never really perfect. You can always go on making it better. You can get addicted to accomplishment. If you're somebody who really likes to get to do, be efficient, your to-do list truly never runs out. You just, you know, take three things, cross three things off, and five more come in on the bottom of the list. And you can also definitely get addicted to self-improvement, going to, going to workshops, seeing a therapist, trying to heal your neurosis, you know. I remember Ramdas once said to me when I, years ago, he said, you know, when I go through these catalogs, one of these catalogs that you get, you know, with the, they're free and it lists all the, all the therapies you can do in your hometown. He said, you know, when I look at these catalogs, I think I've done everything in the catalog. And I can say with some confidence, 
I'm no less neurotic than I was when I started out. <laughs> Just a little more relaxed about it. You know? so, so you can get addicted anywhere in the cycle. Another form of blockage is judgment, which is that you look across the cycle from where you feel addicted, and, you, and that looks really stupid. You know, like if you're really addicted to meditation, you look at somebody who's like, you know, works in a bank and, you know, really efficient, and you go like, oh, what are you doing? You're like a, you're not even a human being, you're like a human doing. You know, it's like, oh, it's just like do, do, do. You know? And then this guy, you know, who's making money is going, why'd you go to India? What's in India? I mean, why are you, why are you wearing, you know, what are you, what are you doing with beads and everything? Is there like a, is there a business opportunity there or something? That works? <laughs> So it's conflicting values, you see. So judgment, you develop judgment about the part of the cycle that is furthest away from where you get addicted. Another kind of blockage we call aspiration resistance. And what that means is you sit somewhere in the cycle, and just ahead of you, it looks amazing. It looks like, wow, how do you do that? And you, I'm going to do that myself later. But it looks, but it just, it's just out of reach. A good example would be if you get really stuck in doing at six o'clock, you meet people you know, who go on vacation. So, oh, you're going to Maui. That's fantastic. I, I so admire you for taking care of yourself. I'm going to take time off soon as well, later, right? <laughs> but but you, can, you can loop like that where resting is just something you always, I, I really want to learn to meditate, but you never quite get around to it. Equally, if you're a very creative person, which has been where I tend to get blocked, if you're a very creative person around 3 o'clock, you keep creating, 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 and you look at someone, someone who's very efficient. They get their book done. They get all their social media. And you go, how do you do that? How do you actually organize all that stuff? You know, I look at people who really got their stuff together. It's, a, it's like a, watching a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. How do you do that? So you, that's aspiration resistance. And the last kind of blockage is called looping, which is actually all too pre prevalent in our world, where you become a specialist in one little part of the cycle, and you just go round and round and round. For example, like a, a, a copy editor or a proofreader is looping in a certain phase of, of the, the creative quadrant, but just going around there professionally. So, four kinds of blockage. Yeah, so four kinds of blockage, but each of those four kinds of blockage exist in all four quadrants. So now, you've got four kinds of blockage and four quadrants, which means 16 styles of brilliance being blocked. And so we've been mapping this, a group of us together, and we've really found it's quite accurate. If you, if you coach somebody, they're either on fire, changing the game for everybody, or there's some kind of blockage. And you can fairly accurately, if you talk to them, you can quickly identify that they're blocked in one of these 16 ways. So you end up with a map that describes 16 unique styles of royally screwing things up. So that's really, that's how we are in default. That's how we are when we're run on the conditioning that we got from our parents. And sadly, that's how many people lead their lives, that there's a gift somewhere to give, but it, the, the blockage is stronger than, than the possibility. Which leads us to the all-pervading grace of practice. And what I mean by practice, I have a fairly wide definition, what I mean by practice is any activity that you involve yourself in, which is consciously and deliberately changing your state. Right? Any, anything you do with the intention of changing your state in some way, I would call a bona fide practice. Right? So, Meditation, obviously, is a practice, but so would um, really listening deeply to somebody is a practice. Being grateful is a practice. Taking nutritional supplements in a conscious way is a practice. Making love is a practice. Taking the day off could be a practice. In fact, just about anything, anything that anyone could recommend to anybody and say, oh, this would be good, 
You could say that's a practice. But this cycle now, not only is it a way to understand 16 flavors of blockage, it also becomes a very accurate map for which practice is helpful in a particular part of the cycle and which practice would actually be detrimental, you see? Because the practice that helps you to get from 1.30 to 2 is not the same practice you need if you're stuck at 7.30 trying to get to 8. You see, see the thing? It's like, it's actually what helps there doesn't help down there. So let me give you a few examples. We've been able to map so far. We've got a catalog of 357 practices that we, um, that we can access in coaching. Uh, arranged all around the cycle, and we've won 100 and, I don't think it's a, 108 of them, 27 in each quadrant that we, you know, that we teach. So it's, uh, it means that when you, when you can accurately locate the quality of blockage, you can also accurately diet, you can also accurately, what's the word, not um, prescribe the right practice. So for example, if we start up, if we start off up here, Here's a practice which is good right after awakening, and we call this seek out pleasure in the body. And this practice is where you just start to pay attention to where there's kind of arousal in the body. We're used to arousal you know, in the genitals as sexual arousal, but you can have arousal all over the place. And if you breathe into a place of aroused energy, of pleasurable aroused energy, breathe in it, into it and give it space, that actually often becomes a song, or an idea, or a, a model, or a new way of understanding. And so another practice then a little further along would be automatic writing. So this would be like a, you know, this would be a 130 practice, just writing without really knowing what you're going to write. If we move a little further along, uh, musicians together, jamming together, you know, where, where they feel they're all being carried by the same creative impulse, that would be like a 230 practice. Uh, Creative visualization, uh, that would be, you know, right around uh, 3.30, the deliberately setting intentions and really getting clear, okay, it's going to be this kind of car with this kind of stick shift and these kind of rim tires. That would be creative visualization practice. Uh, as we move further along that phase of the cycle, uh, making and keeping agreements, deliberately making agreements, and making bigger agreements, so you keep expanding your practice. Like, I promise to have this to you by Friday, and then the next week making a bigger agreement. That makes you stronger in that phase of the cycle. Um, pushing through, staying up all night to meet a deadline. And that's where you get strong sympathetic nervous system dominance, parasympathetic suppression, but you push through to get things done. Now, when you have that kind of sympathetic dominance and you suppress the parasympathetic nervous system, when you finally stop, you get what, what neurologists call uh, parasympathetic flooding. Right? That means that you, when you stop, you actually feel terrible. You've got it done, but ugh, you just feel awful. So actually, feeling pain is a practice. Like deliberately, when you've, when you've burned yourself out, deliberately noticing where you don't feel good and breathing and, and allowing yourself to be with it, whether it's psychological pain from having made a mistake or physical pain from burnout. That's also a viable practice, not often thought of as a practice. You know, here's a great spiritual practice for you. Feel really bad once a day. You know, just really tune in to, tune into those feelings of despair. Uh, I, I advocate clients, actually. When I work with, with, with coaching clients, I really advocate to people. I say, I recommend you have a nervous breakdown every day. <laughs> At the end of the day, just take 10 or 15 minutes to have a nervous breakdown, just to fully go into regret, failure, shame. Just, just do it totally for 15 minutes, and then shake it off and do something else, you know? It, because it allows for learning. So writing a letter of apology, saying, writing to somebody, I'm really sorry about what I did. That would be a, like a 7.30 practice. And finally, self-forgiveness, where you, where you, there's a lovely practice they do in the Hoffman process uh, called the forgiveness walk, where you, you go for a walk and you think about something you regret, and then you say, but I'm a good person, I meant the best, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, I love myself, I'm a good person. That would be like a, an 8.45 practice. And then as we move on, 
as we get past nine o'clock, we enter into spiritual practices, what is commonly recognized as spiritual practices. So at the beginning would be prayer, for example, where you feel very separate from the divine. You know, please, Lord, I have no idea if you're even listening or where you are or divine mother, but please hear me. You, you're praying to something far away. That would be like a 915 practice or um, Hinayana meditation. Like the, 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 there are certain schools of meditation that are really um, that don't anticipate a whole lot of awakening happening, just steady, you know, many decades sit and watch that. Hinayana would be like a uh, 9, 9.30 practice. And as we get closer to 12, we get, we get the practices that just tip you over the edge, you know. So that would be Zogchen uh, or, uh, Zogchen or, or s the self-inquiry of Ramana Maharshi, who is experiencing this moment. Let's see. Whoa, there's nothing there. Wow. You know? So that would be like a tip you into 12 practice. Okay, so that's um, a lightning speed tour of the map, which has proven to be phenomenally helpful in coaching. I mean, it's really, you can actually just say to people, look, you're essentially brilliant. I don't need to say this to the Agarwal sisters because they're... <laughs> but you, you can just say to people, you're essentially brilliant. And if you're not living brilliance every day, let's just take care of it. So it's a, it's a map where once the client gets on board and understands the map, it becomes very quick to be able to say, oh, look, blockage there. Here's the practice. Yeah. What, what, what time? <laughs> there's, there's no moment like now, you know. <laughs> right? You know, what does somebody say? Some day is not a day of the week, you know, right? Yeah. Well, look, I'll tell you what. Let me come on to that in just a sec, because I, what I wanted to, to... I can just finish this piece, and I actually really wanted to leave enough time so that, so that we can talk together. So once this model fully formed itself, I did a bunch of interviews. Over the last 15 years, I've actually have recordings of 420 interviews about... Because I've always been interested in what is it that creates brilliance. And just for the book, I interviewed actually many of you. So in doing interviews... Once we get on the same page that life is about brilliance, right? The point of being alive is to make the most magnificent contribution possible. And like Lynn was saying, like taking care of yourself and money and pleasure, and that's okay. But the real purpose of the game is to make the biggest contribution possible. Once we recalibrate life, as most of us have, to thinking that way, now everything else, everything else we do is either serving brilliance or a distraction, right? So it, you see what I mean? Every, every part of life, either it's helping the brilliance along or it's a distraction. So I wanted the, the book, actually, the first part of the book is the map, but the second part is the territory, which is now we can look at everything we do, everything we eat, everything we listen to, everything we watch on on. The internet, everything we, what time you go to bed, everything can be reconsidered as to whether it serves brilliance or not. So these are some of the topics that, that I explore in the book based on interviews. I've, kind of, I've been able to collect together what people tell me really helps. And I, I want to lay them out, and then as we get into talking together, we can see what we want to explore. So one would be daily routine. Like, what is the daily routine that really... What is the best daily routine that, that maximizes the chances of having original ideas? Another would be sleep. What time to go to bed? How long to sleep? What time do you wake up? Should the room be completely dark? What temperature should it be? All of those factors can affect how brilliant you are. Another is vacations, going on vacation. You know, there's, a, there's a kind of a way we're used to of going on vacation. You know, a lot of people go on vacation and drink and do extreme sports and all kinds of stuff, but there are ways of going on vacation that really allow the cultivation of brilliance. We call it a creation vacation, where you go on vacation in order to devote that time to brilliance. So another, another variable we could consider is sex, which you just asked about is, you know, lots of people have sex. There's lots of reasons to have sex. You'd have sex to make a baby, have sex to alleviate tension, there's many ways you could have sex. There is actually a way to have sex that increases brilliance. It's great. Uh, it's a very popular uh, practice among my clients. So, 
Diet. What, what do we want to be eating and what do we want to not be eating to maximize brilliance? Eric was incredibly helpful for me with that. Wild Fit is often thought of as a way to improve health, but Wild Fit is actually the dietary guide to brilliance. He, he's got it nailed. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's basically pretty much all I say in the diet chapter. I kind of just quote Eric and say, okay, go do Wild Fit, you'll have it nailed. So supplements, what kind of supplements? Do, there's lots of supplements available. This is just what's on John Gray's site. Lots of supplements available. Which ones, which one, which, what are the supplements we need to take in order to maximize the chances of being brilliant? And then there's another category of substances that we could call naughty supplements. Supplements, <laughs> supplements that are right now considered to be illegal. And we can have a whole conversation about that. But there are substances that the government thinks we should not have access to, which actually used in the right dosage, often a very small dosage, um, just, I don't want to advocate this because it's illegal, but still, when I interviewed people, so many people said, well, it was actually that substance that really precipitated brilliance. So I'm just reporting. Uh, <laughs> dissolving belief, right? There are sticky beliefs, latent beliefs that get in the way. How, do we, how can we dissolve those beliefs? Like, I'm not good enough, there's not enough time, no one's going to listen, it's too late, the world's messed up anyway. How can we dissolve belief to maximize the possibility of brilliance? Uh, sitting. So there's, we can meditate in all sorts of ways for all sorts of reasons, but there is a way to develop a sitting practice that is fully in the service of brilliance rather than the pursuit of enlightenment. You know, which, so you can, you can actually re, rededicate your sitting to making a brilliant contribution. Um, prayer, devotion, and surrender. So many people referenced prayerfulness, invoking a higher power as a very instrumental force in maximizing the flow of brilliance. Friendships. That's me and Jonathan Robinson. And we, we have deliberately, consciously devoted our friendship to brilliance. We go for walks with the intention we're going to walk for an hour now and we're going to do practices together to bring forth the gift in each other. And we, and we, we challenge each other in a way to do that. Uh, role models. So who are the people you look up to and how can you cultivate the relationship with role models in a way that causes that to rub off on you? Marketing and promotion. Now, that's something that lots of people talk about. You can market and promote to make more money, you can market and promote to, for lots of reasons, but you can also, marketing and promotion can be in the service of brilliance. And interestingly, we develop a very different attitude to marketing and promotion when it is in the service of the well-being of all sentient beings for generations to come. Mentoring and coaching is almost an essential quality of cultivating brilliance, but it can be done in a different way when we realize that that's the point of being alive. And finally, dedication. And this is what Lynn was so, whew, so unambiguously inspiring about, is when we fully, completely, irreversibly dedicate our lives to the quality of life of the grandchildren of your grandchildren, that's when this thing really kicks in. So we've got a few minutes left, and what I'd really love to do is just zone in on any of those topics that you find most interesting. I did a lot of research and interviews on each of the topics, and I'd love to just dwell on whichever one piques your interest. Yeah, Martin. This is brilliant, really. It's so sublime. And <laughs> Thank you. It's, there's a lifetime here of work and thinking, and I mean, you've mapped out a territory for me that's amazing. Here's one that I'd like help on. I'm noticing lately that I'm addicted to the news. Yeah. And I'm, I want to break that. Yeah. Ideas. Yeah. Okay. Um, honestly, you know, I think there's a fairly simple solution to that. Many of us, many of us have that. Uh, addiction to the internet generally or specifically to the news. So there are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think if we could take the energy that we put into 
uh, dwelling upon what's wrong and channel it into clearly articulated expressions of what we want to create. So in other words, instead of dwelling on the failings of the president, to dwell upon what to dwell upon a vision of what we would like to see happen politically. For example, I've really, I've really gotten clear lately, I don't want to be a Democrat anymore. I don't want to be affiliated to the Democratic Party because I feel it's fueling what I see to be the biggest problem, which is divisiveness. So I actually wanted to have a conversation about what are the values that we can all get behind. Like, um, you know, when... Uh, um, yeah, whenever you hear a story about, like, about a, a child, you know, wh who's, who's ill and, and we're going we're gonna to get together to support a child getting better, that's not a, 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 an issue that creates political divisiveness. And there's lots of things like that. So I think the more that you put your energy, and radical brilliance, it actually creates a kind of a lifestyle, you know. There, there's, a, there's a certain way of life you can develop where the most important thing about being alive is for these impulses to find their way to the surface through you, and then there's a recognition that you're not really doing it. You're just showing up to take a message, you know? I think the more you do that, the more you allow those ideas to percolate in you and find expression, the less hopeless you feel about the news, and therefore the less interested you get in it, you know? So that's one thing we could say, but also, as you said, it does have an addictive quality, and I found there's some great apps that you can use uh, where you just block, you block certain sites. Uh, and I do it until 6 o'clock at night. So I get to look at the news because I find it interesting, but I do it at 6 at night after I've done all my other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mike. How, how do you define brilliance? Good. Thank you. Well, what I mean by it is becoming available becoming an available conduit for something to flow through you which is absolutely beyond the human mind. I don't know that it's particularly necessary to define what that is, because when we do, I mean, it's fine to do that privately, but when we give, it, when we give too much definition to what that source is, it, it kind of puts too much mind on it. You know? So if we say it's male or female or belongs to a particular tradition or something, it, it kind of starts to put it in a human framework. So I remember one of the people that shows up quite prominently in the book is Leonard Cohen. And I consider it to be you know, one of the greatest blessings of my life, really, maybe competing with Shamily is the fact that I got to know Leonard Cohen while he was alive. And we had some incredible Dharma dialogues together. And he writes a lot of songs, you know, like, if it be thy will that I sing no more, that my voice be still as it was before. A lot of his songs are about not, it's not for me, it's for you. So I asked him once in his little kitchen, even after he got his money back, he just lived in this tiny little apartment in West, when, was it West Wilshire? And uh, in his little kitchen, I said, you know, who, who is it you're talking about? When you say you, who are you talking about? And he looked down and he said, I don't like to talk about things that I know nothing about. Oh. Right? I don't like to speak about things about which I do not know. So he was willing to devote his whole life to the service of something he knew nothing about. You know? And I uh, can't remember what you asked now, but that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn touched on it, and you touched on it. Would you just talk a little bit more about the interplay that you see between brilliance and purpose? Well, okay. So, so personally, the flavor that I like, the flavor that appeals to me, is to hand things over to the purpose of that which I know only by its perfume, right? So, you know, people often ask, 
me, and I'm sure they ask you too, like, what's my purpose? And they want to get into the thing, do it, write down, what's my purpose? Figure out what's my purpose. If anyone ever asks me, what's my purpose? I tend to say, you know, that's, that's not a useful question, right? To try and figure that out or understand it in any way. To me, it's not a useful question. What, what I prefer is to recognize that there is this mega purpose like a curriculum of sanity raining down on us, but you've got to take down your umbrella in order to get wet, you know? So there's a curriculum of sanity raining down, and it's looking for volunteers to be in its service. And it's one of those things, you know, when you ask for volunteers, can we get some volunteers, you know? If you raise your hand when it asks for volunteers, everybody gets picked. You know, there's, no, there's nobody who will not be accepted. And I don't always completely know what its purpose is because it's so much bigger than anything I understand. But I do know what it feels like to kind of hook into it, to you know, kind of engage with it and be, be run by it. And I don't always know where it's going, but I definitely know what it feels like to engage. And I, I believe that there are practices that can bring us to that unambiguous engagement, even if we don't always have a clearly defined you know, my purpose is. So this book, you know, I mean, I didn't, honestly, I didn't create this, that this model. I didn't do it. It's definitely true. I didn't do this. It's not, it's not the fruit of, you know, it's, I just had a car accident and was rendered incapable for a while. So I couldn't do anything. And in that, in that kind of like insect laying on its back state, uh, this, uh, this got a chance to deliver itself, you know? There's an analogy I give in the book that I think I, I want to repeat here because it really helps, is imagine that you go and uh, stay in a friend's house, right? You're, you're a guest, and then the friend goes out shopping or something, and you're left alone in the house. And the phone rings, right? And they say, you know, oh, is is John there? I said, no, sorry, John's out. Well, could you take a message? Yeah, okay. I said, so you write down the message, right? I said, no, no. And then you put the message there. And then your friend gets home, and they see this thing. And, they, and, you, and you hear a pause, and you go, they go, wow, Chris, you are an incredible poet. Oh, my God, this is brilliant, you know? He said, no, I just, I just took a message. It's, it's not me. I just took a message, you see? And that's how, at least that's how I feel about this. I just took a message. Yeah. So you recognize that moment when you just lock in, right? Yeah. So would you call that the moment of brilliance? Or yeah, it's when brilliance can flow. Brilliant. Yeah, and in, in my experience, you know, I'm a great lover of practice. So I uh, don't know if Beth's here, but anyway, I mean, the, we did practices every, you know, I'm, whenever there's practice available, I do practice. You know, I, I, I sit at least an hour a day. You know, I do qigong every day. I'm just a great believer in discipline, like regular discipline, where you don't give yourself too much time to just deviate from that, just discipline. Because I just noticed by disciplining the mind-body organism, this kind of monkey, by disciplining it a little bit, it there's much more chance of that brilliance flowing through you when you put the organism into a disciplined state. And sitting is probably one of the most effective disciplines for that. Yeah. Arjuna, when you say sitting, are you talking about meditating or just sitting? Yeah. Because you used a distinction there. <laughs> yeah, I do practices. make that distinction in the book, you know, because uh, when you get into, like, meditating and, like, people, it often becomes, like, a big deal. And then it becomes something you're going to do, you know, get good at it, you know. And um, personally, I found that to be quite counterproductive because the whole point of that kind of time is that there's less of you. If you start putting doing into it, you're putting you back in. So what I like to do is, I wear a blindfold, so even closing my eyes is not something I have to do, you know? Wear a blindfold, and I just sit and wait. And if you sit and wait, and you're, and you're okay with thoughts and, and irritation and whatever, you're okay with that, but you just sit and wait, what I've noticed is sooner or later, grace comes to visit. 
and then it takes you over. It has a gravity to it. It just takes you over. It pulls you down into, yourself, into itself. And that's, for me, where, where, no, that's where all the fun is. So I like to call it sitting because anybody can sit. You know, your dog can sit. Anybody can sit. It's not difficult to sit. But if we just call it sitting and don't add any more, then you can't say that you're not good at it because all you've got to do is sit. You know? um, so, well, I, I want to be... I want to keep my commitment in the three to six, so I just want to say thank you for the kiss. Wow. <laughs> wow.